needs God. We're looking at Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 17, on the subject of making the right choice as we continue our series on wisdom. That's Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 17. And why don't we go ahead as you're finding that, I wonder if we could just go to a word of prayer right now over our time together over this word, over our lives. Lord Jesus, we thank you, God, for the opportunity to be in your presence, the opportunity to get into your word, O Lord, to bow before you and declare that, Jesus, you are Lord. I want to make that choice, O God. Give us strength today. and Give us help, O Lord. Give us conviction, O God. Show your love unto us in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen. Amen. Praise God. Conviction is love. That is the Lord showing you a righter way, showing you the correct way. And it's done so out of love. It's done out of care that I want you to be with me. I want to make you right. I want to make you holy. I want to forgive you. Hallelujah. Amen. And we can make the choice to seek after him. Now, Ecclesiastes 3, verse 17. Why don't you go ahead and stand for the reading of the word if you can. The preacher says, I said in mine heart, God shall judge the righteous and the wicked. For there is a time there for every purpose and for every work. So he will judge the righteous and the wicked. You may be seated. Now, I want you to place yourself in a chamber, a judge's chamber. Why are you there? Because you are the judge. You can't be overwhelmed by the gravity of the burden of justice that weighs upon you. You stand before the mirror in your chambers and adjust your robe. You've had many case studies examining the wrongfully sentenced, lives lost in prison for crimes they did not commit. You've also been moved by victims seeking sentences upon perpetrators that would match the torment their crimes have caused. Justice awaits your gavel. The families of the defendant and the prosecution are pulling on you. You're expected to exercise discretion and prudence in following the law and seeking for justice. You're expected to make judgments that are both legal and balanced that affect persons in this life. And so it is in the eternal courtroom. As anxious as that may seem or or make you to put that weight upon you of, I've got people's lives in my hands. My my verdict and my sentence affects people's lives. Both the, I've got the prosecution pulling me one way and the defense pulling me the other way. And man, how do I find judgment in this system? And it weighs upon the judge. Well, in the eternal courtroom, matters far more significant than those determined in any earthly court are weighed. Everybody say the eternal courtroom. The eternal Eternal courtroom. Here the souls of men are judged. Decisions of life and death are extended to encompass matters of heaven and hell. The judge in this eternal courtroom is not robed in black, but in white, denoting his righteousness. As Jesus declared in John 5.22, The Father hath committed all judgment to the Son. And also in Matthew 25.31, The Son of Man is going to sit on His throne of glory. And Paul promises in Romans 14.10, We shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. The Honorable Jesus Christ sits atop this court And he knows who and what he is. The sovereign God. His judgments are true and righteous all together. He has never known a moment of unrighteous bias. Everything he does is guided by perfect wisdom. Because God will judge both the wicked and the righteous, we must exercise wisdom in making the right choices. And somebody said amen. Amen. God is a righteous judge. Among God's many immutable characteristics is His righteousness. 
It is not merely that all his deeds are righteous or that all his words are righteous. He is in every his very essence righteous. There is no uncleanness or corruption in him at all. And that God allows his judgment to flow from his character, every decision he has ever made is the right one. He's never gotten it wrong. He is righteous. Mm -hmm. Psalm chapter 9 and verse 8 speaks to, it says, And he shall judge the world in righteousness. He shall minister judgment to the people in uprightness. It just flows from his rightness, his righteousness. God is a righteous judge, and he determines what is right and what is wrong. We're living in a world where guidance and direction are at a premium. The mentality that anything goes and, and follow after your own self-gratification and follow after your heart, follow after this philosophy and that philosophy. There is no one right way. Just follow after whatever seems right to you. Whatever works for your mentality. And people, unfortunately, are so lost in this day by that mentality. A 23-year-old woman was driving her car through the Ontario town of Tobermory. It was unfamiliar territory for her, so she was dutifully following her GPS. She was following something that we would think and, and I would think is going to be what is correct. It's going to give us the correct direction. We have confidence in the GPS. Indeed, she was so intent on following the device that she didn't notice that her car was headed straight for Georgian Bay. So she drove down a boat launch and straight into the frigid water. Now that's obedience. <laughs> she th thankfully managed to climb out and swim the shore as her bright red Yaris sank beneath the waves. In Manhattan, one man followed his GPS into a park where his car got stuck on a staircase. Must have had one of those roads similar to our Jackson meeting 3rd Avenue, which turns into a staircase. <laughs> and he was found there stuck. In Europe, a Belgian woman was led remarkably astray by her GPS, turning what was supposed to be a 90-minute drive to Brussels into a day-long voyage into Germany and beyond. And perhaps we can sympathize, and I definitely would sympathize with people who were led astray by a GPS that was less than accurate. All of us have received wrong directions from the guidance of a system at one time or another. And within our moral uh, area, within our decisions, that guidance system was called sin. We were guided in a wrong path. Something deceived us in that direction. It was a perhaps just a feeling of gratification that I need to have right now. And we were led in that path. And when we follow its guidance, we always end up in the wrong places doing the wrong things. Yes. Sadly, many people become lost for eternity and are never able to recover themselves to travel the right road. Thankfully, God has given us two very reliable guidance systems, His Word and His Spirit. God is a righteous judge, and He determines the wrong way to take. Because to accurately determine one state, there absolutely must be a fixed point of moral reference, an unchanging standard of what is Wrong. Can somebody say amen? amen? If there is not a standard of what is wrong, then nothing, no matter how reprehensible, can rationally be declared off limits. Abuse of a child? Just a part of my culture. Yes. How can one say this is morally wrong unless he accepts that some benchmark exists? Unless there is an internal yardstick against which to measure it, how can one say that murder, rape, or any other action is wicked? But God, the righteous judge, determines that alone. And unfortunately, society, having cast away his touchstone, the benchmark, the gold standard of God's righteousness, we live in a world that offers more compassion for a fish caught from a lake than a baby ripped from the womb. 
but God determines what is right. Mm -hmm. God's nature also determines what is right. And He gives the promise of a blessed life when we live by it. In our earthly judicial system, ignorance of the law is no excuse for breaking it. A natural defendant cannot simply claim that he did not know his actions were illegal and thereby escape punishment. I didn't know, I didn't see the, the speed limit sign. I'm sorry, Coast Guard, I didn't know I was supposed to have one of those little whistles aboard and a flare gun and, and lights and, and different things that are required. Well, that's neat. Let me write this ticket up for you. Yes. Amen. And then you can... Uh, take the ride of shame on back to the dock. I'll escort you personally. Amen. Well, I didn't know. Well, now you do. Praise God. But similarly, a man will stand before God without excuse because God's Word has already established the criteria by which he will be judged. And before I go any further, Brother Damien, I appreciate how you have taught me. Amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. But there can be no debate about what is good. That has already been established. God has already communicated that judgment. We know it. We have given the word of God. God can give us the ability to make wise judgments. God will judge us all one day. But until that time, we are given the right and responsibility to judge ourselves. Let's head to 2 Corinthians chapter 13. Verse 5. Did I mention I love our Coast Guardsmen, praise God, and women serving our country? Hallelujah. Amen. <laughs> Amen. God bless them. Amen. Praise God. 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 5 says, Examine yourselves, whether ye be in the faith. Prove your own selves. Our inability to evaluate rightly our ways demand that we yield to the voice of God in our lives. He will assist us in making wise judgments because I can't do it on my own. I don't care how, uh, how philosophically educated I may be. I don't care how many books I pour into. I don't care how much of man's wisdom I seek after. Proverbs 14.12 remains true unto me. There is a way, Proverbs 14.12 says, There is a way which seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. But I'm so appreciative, Brother Victor, of James 1 and 5, which gives us the promise that we've mentioned before in this series. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally, and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. Aren't you thankful that you can seek unto God for wisdom and decisions? Hallelujah. You can seek after the Spirit. Amen. You can be in tune with the Spirit of God to guide you in your life. And we are seeking today, if I could reach one individual, amen, who before the appointed hour, that he would choose to seek after the Lord now. That there would be a choice to repent in their heart now. As we, as we get into the consequences, as we get into the weight and the, and the burden upon what, what hangs in the balance upon our decisions in this life, in this time. But I'm so thankful that God can give us the ability to make wise judgments. Yes. Solomon judged wisely after getting help from God. Two women who shared a house came to King Solomon with a dispute. They had, they had each given birth to a son within three days of one another. During the night, one of the women rolled over on her son, smothering him to death. When she awoke and realized what had happened, she devised an insidious plot. She took her dead child and laid him in her roommate's bed. And she took her roommate's living child and brought him back to bed with her. And in the morning, the second woman awoke and was devastated to think she had killed her child and knew that this is not my child. And as she lovingly poured over him, she realized he was not her son. Her son was still living. 
So each roommate, or each woman rather, claimed the living child was her own, and the dead child belonged to her roommate. And the case was brought before the crown. How would Solomon decide such a matter? And it's a, she said, she said, and he's listening to the bickering between them, and he understands all I've got to do is bring the real mother out. All I've got to do is set a scenario where the real mother is going to stand up in this place. Amen. Go and get me a sword. I've had enough of listening to you and enough of listening to you. I'm about to spill something in this place. I'm about to separate something in this place. I'm going to make it to where the real mother, something inside of her is going to rise up. And there I will realize who it is. I don't know how calmly he spoke. I don't know how irritated he was when he spoke. But he says this is wisdom. And in this division, the real mom is going to usher forth. Hallelujah. The real mom is going to begin to speak out. The one that's got the emotion. The one that is lovingly attached. Hallelujah. She's going to, it's going to be something that's going to rise up. And she's not going to allow, even though this my roommate is a piece of human debris to do what she has done. I don't care. Let the boy live. I don't care who raises him. He's got to live. Yes, amen. And Solomon said the real mama just stood up. Hallelujah. Praise God. I'm thankful for people that can rise up in compassion. Amen. And I'm thankful for the wisdom of preaching. The wisdom of scenarios that can bring out the best in people. That can bring out greatness in people. Hallelujah. There's wisdom that wants to do that for you. There's some God wisdom that wants to touch and minister through your life. Hallelujah. You can be like Solomon and you can be like this mother. Hallelujah. You can operate with wisdom and you can operate with passion. Praise God. Amen. And the writer of Solomon, didn't it say something about that love is going to win? Amen. There's no, no, no force more powerful than love. Hallelujah. Yes. Somebody clap your hands unto God. Oh, thank you, Jesus. This is where the anointing starts to show up on a Wednesday Bible study. Amen. Where I start to understand there's power. There's life-saving power in giving my life unto wisdom. Praise God. I can save me. I can save others. Amen. I can bring out the best in other people. Hallelujah. My life can be a blessing. I can change a community. I can do stuff that I never thought possible under my own power and ability I can give myself unto greatness yes. God can move and use yes. me yes. in a mighty way I love Boko. Yes, worship God right now. Oh, come on. You're talking to the great spirit. All creator. All powerful. Almighty. God, can I give my mind unto you, Lord, that you would move upon me? Can we as a people give ourselves unto you, Lord, that you would make us mighty? You would make us powerful. You would make us wise, God. Give us a discerning heart, Lord. I want to be used of you. Yes, Thank you, Jesus. It was in Exodus 31, verse 1 through 6. The power of God's wisdom coming upon individuals. Getting in touch with the Spirit that supernaturally... You were able to craft something that you had no ability to do before. You were given the craft. You were given an ability to form things and to make things. But oh, something supernatural happened when God got a hold of you in His wisdom. When you gave yourself over unto God. It says in verse 1, the Lord spake unto Moses saying, It's not just going to be you, Moses, that's going to have to do everything. It's not just you, Moses, that I've given wisdom. But... I have called Bezalel, the son of Uri, the son of Ur of the tribe of Judah. And I have filled him with the Spirit of God in wisdom and in understanding and in knowledge and in all manner of workmanship. And he's going to be able to craft under the anointing, under the wisdom that God has given. 
Bezalel means in the shadow of God. I've been living under the shadow of God. And God says, you've been willing to walk under my shadow. You've been willing to trust in my protection. You've been willing to trust in my law and in my word. Now it's time for me to push you out. Amen. Your, your abilities now are going to be shown to everybody. Your abilities are going to be appreciated by everybody. Your abilities are going to house the presence and spirit of God. Your abilities are going to craft mercy. Your abilities, amen, are going to be sprinkled with the blood of atonement. Oh, come on now. We're not just talking about something meager. Hallelujah. We're talking about the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God has gotten a hold of this place. Amen. And it's beginning to move upon minds and upon hearts to understand that the best life lived is the life given unto God. Hallelujah. Oh, come on, somebody. Start to extend those hands unto Him. Yes, God. I want that in my life. I want what's real. Hallelujah, hallelujah. I want to walk under Your shadow, Lord Jesus. Praise God. Praise God. Hallelujah, hallelujah. And we must choose what is righteous. Living for God is a series of choices. Initially, we choose to surrender our lives to Him, but that is hardly the last time we will do so. Each day we are faced with a multitude of choices about our activities, our words, our thoughts, and our lifestyle. In each of these moments, our choices must be directed by something higher than what we personally desire. I desire stupid stuff in the moment. Ridiculous, base, pointless. We must be steered by the answer to the question, what is righteous? Is it a wise decision? Our human perspective tends to be limited to the immediate. What feels good right now? What is appealing presently? Oh, I've been there, but oh, I want to be in this place. Psalm 119, verse 105. The great psalm speaking about the, a love affair with the commands of God. Hallelujah. An affection for the wisdom of God. It says, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. His word shows both where we are presently our feet, it's a light unto my feet where I'm at presently, and where we are heading, our path. This enables us to exercise judgment righteously. Hallelujah. God, you're concerned with right where I'm at. You are a light to right where I'm at, and you're guiding me down a path. Hallelujah. There's a purpose to it. Amen. There's direction to it. There's promise in it. Hallelujah. Amen. No one can choose for us. We will either follow God's ways and allow His Word to guide our paths toward a good destination, or we will choose to follow our own flawed hearts and fleshly desires and thus be directed down destructive paths. For his soul's sake, a man must choose what is righteous. In this life, only two things are certain. Death and taxes. <laughs> death and taxes. But Hebrews 9.27 says, no, there's more than that. There are clearly more than just two that are certain. It says, and as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment. God certainly judges the hearts of men currently, and He meets out temporal consequences for our action in this realm of life. As serious as that is, it pales in comparison to the sobering fact that one day after our death, each of us will stand before God for eternal judgment. Yep. 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 Oh, God. God, that I would have the wisdom. God, that there would be an anointing like Solomon, where he was able to, to pull something out of a woman, able to pull something out of a mother. Could I pull conviction? and a desire for God out of somebody? Could I pull life out of somebody that they would choose the life in Jesus 
rather than the death of judgment. Ecclesiastes 3.17, our text. I said in mine heart, God shall judge the righteous and the wicked, for there is a time there for every person and for every work. As Paul declared in Romans 2.16, at the appointed time, God will judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ. Yes. And He will judge the wicked. Let's turn to Revelation chapter 20, verses 11 through 15. Revelation 20, 11 through 15. John testifies, I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from those from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away. And there was found no place for them. They fled away, but there was found no hiding place for them. There was just no way to get away. There was no way to go. You had to come to judgment. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged every man according to their works, and death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death, and whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. We can only imagine the terror that will be present on that day when all knees bow, and all tongues confess that Jesus is Lord. But they're doing it too late for any eternal safety. What words will I be able to say unto God at that point? In a guilty state, refusing to receive so great a mercy. All the messages that were heard, all the yes. times I was invited to come to a spiritual place, yeah. come to a place of repentance. And, and and God wronged me or I, I wasn't uh, in a position to receive God or I just have a different mentality or you know what, I just don't believe that. Or I've got so many questions and accusations to bring against God. It sounds like there's only a few words that you're going to be able to bring against the Lord. And you're not bringing anything against Him. You're just going to be able to declare Jesus Christ is Lord. That's, right. That's about the, the extent of what will be able to be spoken at that time. Hallelujah. Scripture says, Every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. No room or availability for a hiding place. Every unrighteous man and woman will stand before God and will be judged out of the books. When their names are not found in the book of life, they are then judged based on the contrast between the record of their deeds and the Word of God. You didn't receive justification through my blood. You didn't receive atonement and propitiation and, and the amount of, of words our vocabulary fails to all things that Jesus provides for us. Yeah. You didn't receive that. You said, I can live on my own rightness. I can choose my own path. Okay. Well, we'll open up the book of rightness. Yeah. And we'll see how well you did. Oh. We'll see how well your righteousness measured up to the Word of God. Since you were too good for my covering. Since it wasn't convenient enough for you for my covering. Since your lifestyle was more important than my covering. Since you... It's all of that. We'll see how well it measures up. No one, Romans 3.20 tells us, can fulfill the requirements of God's law. It is incumbent on us to respond to God's grace now by obeying the gospel and being born again of water and spirit so our names are found in the book of life. I have a question for you to meditate on for just a second. Meditate for a moment on the fear with which sinful men will kneel before God on that day. How should the fear of the Lord shape our current devotion to Christ? Hmm. 
Oh God, I don't want to take on a, a, a hostile tone. I want to take on a tone of grace. Yes. And guess what? There's still opportunity. Hallelujah. Yes. Right oh, that blood, amen, still reaches the highest mountain, the lowest valley. Yes, amen. There's no pit of sin that that blood cannot reach and pull you out of. Oh, there's no sin committed that's possible. Amen. God can reach unto you. Hallelujah. God can forgive you. Amen. There's opportunity to confess Him now. There's opportunity to invite Him into your life now. There's still time to be buried in His name in baptism. There's still time to be baptized in the Spirit to yield unto God. Yes. Praise God. Praise God. And let that idea of what will take place, and not an idea, I should say the truth of what will take place. John said, you, you can speak of it as idealism. I saw it. I saw it take place. I saw the world give up her dead. I saw the sea give up her dead. And they all got marched before the white throne of judgment. I saw the bowing take place. It's not theoretical. It's not ideal. This is what is going to happen. And in light of that, how should that shape our current devotion to Christ? Oh, God. How should that shape as, as Peter reminded that God said, Be holy as I am holy. Oh, thank you, God, for giving us so great a salvation. Amen. Thank you, Lord, for giving us so great a salvation. That, that makes me want to have your covering on your life, on my life. The, the sleep that I that I give up in order to have a time of prayer and, and a word before my day, that, that doesn't seem like too much anymore. Not when considering what's at stake. Oh, God, it's worth it to know you and to have devotion unto you. Praise God. Let's just meditate upon Him for a moment. Oh, now is a good time to just begin to give your life unto the Lord. Good time to make some devotion unto the Lord, to make some vows unto God, saying, Lord, I'm going to get more serious about this thing. Forgive me, Lord Jesus, not being as devoted to your cause as I should. As we come to a close, Paul spoke to the blood bought born again believers. And he said, we're all going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Every one of us shall give account of himself to God. This is when we will give an account of our service unto Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 11 through 15, or 10 through 15, tells us, For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Hallelujah, He's the foundation. Now if any man build upon this foundation, that's us. Foundation, we receive salvation upon the Lord. Upon that foundation we stand, we're able to live. Hallelujah. Now if any man build upon this foundation, gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest. For the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire. And the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abideth, which he shall build, hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss. But he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. So on that day, each of us will give account for how we were stewards of our time and so great a salvation. How did you build upon this foundation? Did you invest in the wood, the hay, and stubble? Did you invest in God's giving you salvation and you invested in what just passes away? What is meaningless in the whole scheme of things? How were we stewards of our time, our talents, and our treasure? 
We will be judged for our investment in God's kingdom and how we conducted our lives as members of His body. We will be judged for what we judge to be vital and what we deemed to be valueless. Oh God, let it be, Lord Jesus, that my time, my energies, hallelujah, my everything was placed upon what is eternal. Oh, Daniel spoke about how those that lead others to righteous, they're going to start, shine like the stars of the sky. Hallelujah. Amen. And knowing what we know about stars, that might not be the best analogy, but what he was reaching for is how they're going to be eternal. Amen. They're going to be forever. That's the investment that you want to make is that you continue to shine on for the Lord. Amen. And I want to continue for Him in Jesus' name. Praise God. And I want to finish with one more story. And that is, life oftentimes brings us stop signs when in the Spirit we need to move forward. We need to continue on. And it's kind of like this. There was a minister named G.A. Mangan, very powerful, so used mightily of God, so given to the eternal built a powerful church, but his way of, of uh, blowing off a little bit of steam was to fly. He would go to an, an airport and, and, and uh, hop in a, his plane and take off on a flight and then come back and, and feel a little bit restored. And there was one instance where he was coming out of the airport on a <clears throat> uh, connection from the airport to the main highway. And there was a, a spot where there's a stop sign. And he kind of just continued and rolled through the stop sign. He, he, he was safe and, and stopped and so forth, but didn't quite follow the letter of the law. And a trooper came with the party lights and pulled him over and said, Sir, you did not make a full stop. And he said, You know what? There doesn't need to be a stop sign there. There needs to be a yield sign at this particular area. And that's the message for individuals. Amen. That's a message for a preacher. In the things of God, when you're, when, you're, when you're following after God, there's no stop sign. We, in our flesh, we want to stop. Amen. Different things say, hey, stop. You, you, you don't want to be known as one of those people given to God. You don't want to be known as one of those little Christian sissies. You don't want to be known as one of those fanatics that's talking in tongues and yes, dressing differently and, and living for God and so forth. And there's a stop sign that's there. But oh, I say put in a yield sign. Amen. Just yield yourself unto God and keep on living for Him. We'll continue the story. Yes, let's do that. Amen. And so the trooper wrote him a ticket. So... Reverend Mangan got home, called the governor, and said, said Governor, I, I, I got a ticket for rolling through this, this stop sign. The governor wanted to know who the trooper was and said, I'll, I'll send him to New Orleans. He said, no, he, I don't want his family to get wrecked. I don't want a transfer. I don't want anything to happen to the ticketing uh, trooper. What I want is a yield sign to be placed in that area. And that governor said, before it's dark tonight, there's going to be a yield sign put up in that spot. Amen. That's the kind of immediate feedback I like from our elected officials. Amen. That's the kind of pull that I would like. And uh, his son now pastors, uh, Anthony Megan now pastors. I mean, he's, he's uh, a bishop for our movement. But he said they had construction to that area, and they, um, the contractor was uh, attending his church, and he asked, hey, it'd mean the world to me if you could give me that yield sign that, that dad helped to you know, put in place. And so he has that yield, that actual yield sign in his garage as just a legacy to remember dad and, and his influence and, and yes. so forth. Amen. And, but he said nothing bothered him like this one incident. He's not getting a ticket. It, you know, it, that, that's overwritten. But it bothered him that there's a stop sign when there should be a yield sign. Amen. And I would for us, as that governor said, before the sun goes down, I would that we would have that kind of, of uh, passion towards God and say, Lord, I'm going to give you everything before the sun goes down today. Amen. 
before the sun goes down, God, I want to yield everything unto you because I want to fly away with your church. I want to be with you in the heavenly realm, God. Amen. Let's make that our dedication right now, God. Lord Jesus, let me yield of myself unto you that I can follow after your will and your way, Lord, in the precious name of Jesus Christ. For each individual, Lord God, everybody listening, oh Lord, let us receive of you tonight, God, and not stop in our devotion to you, but rather yield of ourselves, oh God. Yield, oh Lord, of our lives. Yield of our wills. In Jesus' holy name. Thank you.